So you are Dwayne E. Arnold. Your DOC number is 119087. You're seeking a commutation of your sentence. You were sentenced in Washita Parish, September 1987. You, uh, for ag attempted aggravated rape, you received a two years hard labor sentence. For an aggravated crime against nature, you received a 15 year hard labor sentence. Attempted second degree murder, you received a 20 year sentence. And then aggravated kidnapping, you received a life sentence. Is that information correct, Mr. Arnold? Yes, ma'am. All right. Would you answer Mr. Marabella, please? Good afternoon, Mr. Arnold. My name is Tony Marabella. Uh, your case was assigned to me, so I'll be asking questions initially. Okay. Can you hear me all right? Well, uh, yes, sir, Your Honor. Uh, Mr. Uh, Col Mr. Uh, Arnold, how old are you, sir? 64, sir. And how long have you been in prison on these charges? Uh, I did uh, 35 years. I, I've read the report. I've read your file. And, uh, you, you know, I, I have to say this is a strange case. I mean, this is a... Uh, as I read who you are, who you were back then, the, the, the facts of this case just baffle me. So I, I want you to it, tell me as best you can remember uh, what you recall about what happened in this case. <clears throat> yes, sir. On that, on that day, I was out running errands and I was getting ready to go back on active duty. And while I was out, I was drinking and going around seeing some of my friends. And I was going to head home that evening and I was at a stop sign and I went to turn, I was supposed to turn left, but I got impatient and I turned right because I was going to circle around. And in the process of going down the road, I seen what I thought was a GI by a dress and his haircut. And I picked him up. And when he got in the car, he had asked me about did I, you know, smoke weed and all this. And I told him no. And then, you know, he kept badgering me about it. And I reluctantly, you know, went ahead and smoked what he had. And next, after that, I don't remember nothing until I seen a deputy that told me I was under arrest. Let's talk a little bit about that then now. You're drinking. Did you drink a lot back then? Yes, sir, I did, Your Honor. When did you start drinking? Uh, how old were you when you first started drinking? Probably about 13, sir. And how how often did you drink as you grew older? About, I'd say every other day or, or you know, it wasn't the time that I didn't drink in a week. I was drinking regular. And what did you drink? Beer, mainly some wine. Now, on this particular day, what had you been drinking? Beer, wine, and liquor with whiskey. So you had been drinking pretty much most of the day on this particular day? Yes, sir. Now, prior to picking up this fellow, had you ever done drugs before? I did in junior high. Uh, uh, all I did was smoke weed every now and then, but I never did hard drugs like cocaine or stuff like that. Well, what prompted you to let this guy talk you into doing that? He had a, he had a uh, piece in his lap and I made a statement I shouldn't have did. He told me he was going down to you know the red roof in to pick up some dope and everything. And I said, Well, you don't know me from Adam, and you're gonna tell me you're all your business and everything like that. And that he got kind of belligerent, and that's when I went ahead and you know hit hit you know hit his little joint he had. He had a piece in his lap. Gun? Yes, sir. Uh so let's talk a little bit about what you've done since you've been in prison. Tell me a little bit about some of the things that you've accomplished while you've been in prison. Yes, sir. 
Well, I, I, I made class B trustee and over the years, I've been mentoring guys at work, trying to show them how to, you know, good work ethics and uh, moral standards and how to change their attitude, their thoughts, their beliefs, and their feelings. And I took classes, you know, um, classes to uh, better, better myself and stay a positive attitude. And when you, when you say you, you helped people try to have better attitudes, uh, mentoring them, was it a specific program or was it just something you did in your spare time? Tell me a little bit about that. I did that at work, Your Honor. I, I, you know, when they come, a lot of guys come off the street, they were uh, never did have a job or nothing. And I wanted to make sure that they, you know, got the job done. It wasn't a matter that I'm a prisoner and they're looking at this as a free person. It's still a job. And I, I like to see the job accomplished and done well. Let's talk about your job. Now, you've worked. Uh, with prison enterprises for 34 years, is that right? Yes, sir. Tell me what, what you do there. Tell me what kind of work you do there. Right now, I'm a file clerk, and at, when I first started, I worked in the shop. And by self-motivation, I learned every area within the shop and how to you know perform to do the job. And I got to the point where I could train other inmates how to do the job in a safe manner. Now, let, let's go back a little bit back during the time of, of this offense. Tell me a little bit about your military career. How long were you in the military? Uh, active duty, I say I did two, two enlistments. So six, about six, eight years, sir. Now, does that include the reserves that you were in as well? No, sir. Okay. Now, did you then go back into the reserves? I went. I got off active duty and went into reserves. So my time, where they had what they call a, a IRR, is an inactive readiness reserve, to where your retirement points don't stop. So that's how come I went into reserve. Now, let, let me let me ask you this: Had, had you ever been convicted of anything before this? No, sir. Had you ever been charged with any sort of rape or any sort of kidnapping before? No, sir. Now, you went to trial? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, during this trial, did you learn what all you had done? I learned what happened when I was in the jail cell in West Monroe. Because when I came to, when I came to, I knew some of the deputies in, in West Monroe because I was in the reserve with them. And when they came in and told me what happened, it kind of shocked me and I was kind of devastated because I had never hurt no one, not you know, no, no woman or child. Only one I've ever hurt has been myself. When you learned what it is that you did, as you sat through the trial, and you listen to all of the things. Did you become convinced that in spite of the fact that you didn't remember any of these things, that you had done that? They say I've done it, Your Honor, and, and I have no reason to believe that they would fabricate a story on me because I'm, I'm not a person that you can mistake for someone. Tell me what, once you accepted that, Tell me what your thoughts are about what this woman must have done. Excuse me, I didn't understand. I didn't hear well, you. Well, once, once you listened to all of the facts and accepted the fact that in spite of the fact that you didn't remember doing it, you apparently did do it. What did you think? How do you think that affected that woman, the victim in this case? I think Ms. Jones was devastated. And I, and I, I you thought sir, about that while you've been in prison. What what effect this had on her? Yes, sir, I have. I think about it every day. Now I know you've taken some programs, not very many programs. What programs have you taken while you've been in prison? 
100 hour pre-release, thinking for a change. I've, I've been in LJYA, Dale Carnegie, and LACB, and that's incarcerated. Now, did you ever have the opportunity to take the sex offender treatment from you? I'm on backlog for that, Your Honor. Okay. And how long do you think it will take you to be able to get into that program? Do you know? I do not know, sir. I'm still on backlog. What sort of things did you learn in thinking for a change? Thinking for a change, I learned how to change my attitude, my thoughts, my beliefs, and my feelings and learn how to uh, how to affect your consequences and how to affect effective listening. Okay. Now, tell me a little bit about your disciplinary record. Do you know how many uh, write-ups you've had since you've been in prison? Seven, sir. When was your last one? 2011, Your Honor. And are you currently in any programs right now? Thinking for a change in 100 hours, sir. Oh, you're, you're currently in those programs now? Yes, sir. And your transition plan is to go to work, to, to go with the uh, Louisiana Parole Project? Yes, sir. And Ms. Cole is here. Uh, they've accepted you as a client if you are eligible at some point to go to that program? Yes, sir. And what do you understand that program to be able to help you with? Well, I, I think they would help me with counseling, wherever, you know, whatever aspect of counseling I need and, and help me to uh, fit back into society. Uh, Warden, can uh, you tell us anything about uh, Mr. Arnold? Yes, sir. Uh, I guess the, the, the biggest thing I can say is that uh, since December of 1988, uh, I don't know whether the tag plant found him or he found the tag plant, but he maintained uh, employment there, per se, up until present. So, what, uh, 30, 34 ish years? He's, he's been an asset to them. And like you said, he has learned everything in that tag plant. He currently, uh, Helps him out uh, as a clerk. He's had a little bit of medical issue lately. Um, got a little brief summary about his history of hypertension, uh, hyperlipidemia, diabetes. He suffered renal cancer um, with a right nephrectomy, as well as uh, survived a bout of uh, Fournier's gangrene. So he's had some medical issues. Uh, in the past, but uh, still continues to work. From a standpoint, you 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 discussed his uh, his write ups. He's not been a disciplinary issue for us at all. Thank you very much, Warden. Uh, Madam Chairman, that's all the questions. Um, I don't see any other questions. So, Mr. Arnold, we'll hear from those uh, the speakers first. We'll start with Mr. Kerry Myers from the Parole Project. Uh, good afternoon, Kerry Myers, Louisiana Parole Project. Uh, a long time ago, uh, my first visit in the visiting room, uh, I looked up uh, behind the counter where the pizzas were being sold, and I saw Dwayne Arnold. Uh, my children were there visiting me, um, and we went to get a pizza, and you know, they don't call Dwayne Arnold a gentle giant for nothing. You know, my first thought was, man, I want to be friends with this guy because if I ever get in trouble, I want him on my side. Uh, but he was, my kids still ask about him today. That's the kind of impact he had on my own children. They still ask, how is Mr. Arnold? Uh, I can tell you that it, his contributions to service, to community service, uh, at Angola are, are numerous and steady. Uh, in the organizations with the vets incarcerated, with the toy shop, with LJYA, uh, with, with a, he's an honorary member of the of Latin American Brotherhood, uh, Cultural Brotherhood, because of the service work he did for them. Uh, they made him an honorary member. Uh, at the tag plant, 
he's not only uh, trained other inmates, he's trained supervisors during the 34 years he's been there. Um, not to argue against his, his recommendation, but should he leave, they're gonna have a hard time replacing him, but that's not a reason to not give him a recommendation today. Uh, just wanna <laughs> add that. He is uh, an honorably decorated discharge veteran who has served his country well. And I think as, as Mr. Marabella has already stated, uh, this is just not characteristic of Mr. Arnold at all, uh, this crime. Um, I do not believe Mr. Arnold would be a threat to anyone, uh, our public safety. Uh, he has a transition plan with parole project. When he has completed parole project, when we determine that Mr. Arnold is ready, he has a great transition plan to his family back in Pennsylvania. Uh, I can honestly say that I, I have, Mr. Arnold is, is one of those people that will always uh, stick with me uh, in, in remembering um, his contributions to the community at Angola. And personally, uh, I consider him my friend. And so I would ask this board uh, to consider granting his recommendation today. Thank you, Mr. Myers. We have Mr. Ronald Arnold. Yes, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank the board, the parole project and Mr. Myers for this opportunity. As he stated, I am the brother of Dwayne E. Arnold. I'm the only living member of our initial family and I miss him very much. Uh, Growing up, not a father in our household. Dwayne and I had a very close childhood. Our upbringing, our upbringing <clears throat> was being reared <clears throat> by our grandfather and our uncles. As young men, we both served our country in the military, the United States Army where we both excelled as lead in to leadership roles. Myself as an infantryman and Dwayne performing military intelligence operations. Dwayne is intelligent and a passionate man. He has matured, I feel, during this incarceration to better himself. And I think he's better than us. His worth ethnics and skills have excelled him to perform clerk one to clerk three duties with honors as far as the records that I have. He's got recorded performance evaluations as satisfactory or better. And as Mr. Meyer stated, uh, I talk to him bi-weekly on my days off uh, and he takes pride in performing the responsibilities in the shop operations with limited supervision. God willing, allow Dwayne to re-enter society and have a second chance to succeed, to continue to succeed through prominent influences in community service. Dwayne will be law-abiding and ideal mentor and he will not be incompatible with the interest and welfare of society. Please help us bring him on. Thank you. Thank you, so. Um, Good afternoon, everyone. For me, those are two hard acts to follow. I did have something prepared, but I don't even think I can read it at this point. But I am truly his support back here in Pennsylvania. My home will be open to him to have a place to live. <laughs> he has numerous family members that's here to support him in every way that we can to help him get involved in any type of programs he may need to be involved in, help him get employment, um, I know that he has health issues, you know, we're here to 
applied to see if he can get disability, if we're not able to get him employment for his health issues. Um, he has a niece and a nephew that's eager to have him in their lives because they've never met him. He has numerous young, younger cousins that are eager to meet him and have them in their lives and to even help him learn the new technology that we have nowadays. He just has a lot of family support. And as Mr. Meyer said, anyone that knows Dwayne knows that Dwayne is a gentle giant. I've never in my life ever known Dwayne to be violent. Kids, babies, they all gravitate to Dwayne. There's just an awesome spirit about him and always has been. I'm more like a little sister to him than a cousin and I'm honored that he calls me his sister and I'm honored to be able to open my home for him to come live with me. I'm just praying for the opportunity of him to get clemency, to come home and spend the rest of his days and the rest of our days with his family. I'm asking that the board would please vote yes to grant Dwayne clemency to come home to be with his family. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Henderson has surrendered his spot to speak to Ms. Carmen Rutledge. So we'd like to hear from Ms. Carmen. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone. What a pleasure to be able to do and to speak on my cousin's behalf. I'm the oldest. I'm the one that has known him from diapers, been with him, babysat, and he's always been a part of my home and my life until there was a time when we didn't know where he was at. But I never, I was always so close to him that I knew within my heart that we would reconnect. And that was a prayer that I always had. Yeah. Yes, some things happened in his life. And unfortunately, when we found out, several things have happened. But in spite of that, in spite of what he went through, in spite of his past, and this may be an oxymoron, sometimes things have, have to happen. And because it happened, he became a better man. This man, he always had a passion. He always had a love for people. He always extended himself to do above and beyond every circumstance, any situation, he would always go out there. And by the grace of God, through all of this mess, there was a blessing. In spite of the years being incarcerated, he has touched lives. He has reached beyond prison bars to touch lives. He has brought us as a family together to love and to support, not just him, but each other, to have a common goal for someone that we are willing to just speak up for. And even my grandson, I was never ashamed, but he connected with my grandson over thousands of miles. And my grandson, just from communicating with this man, my grandson is a straight A student. He's a football player. He plays on, in the band. He is just so enamored by someone who could, through adversity, he never gave up. And I believe it takes courage to continue, to keep on keeping on. And by the grace of God, he'll continue, he'll continue to do this. I pray that you'll consider to bring this man home. Thank you so much for your time. God bless you. Thank you. All right, I think that's everybody. So uh, we'll ask Mr. Arnold, is there a statement you'd like to make before we turn it over to Ms. Cole? Yes, ma'am. Uh, board members, uh, honorable board members, I will not try to downplay the nature of my crime to you. I know the effects of my crime have been dev devastating to Ms. Jones and her family and my family as well, who are victims also, and to the communities of West Monroe and Monroe. I accept full responsibility for my actions 
for committing this crime. And I, I acknowledge the fact that I deserve to be in prison for the crime I committed. While incarcerated, I learned I learned that progress is impossible without change. If I'm not willing to change my mindset, I cannot change my ways. If I cannot change my ways, I cannot change my direction. If I cannot change my direction, I will never be able to change my future consequences. And by changing my attitude, my beliefs, my thoughts, and my feelings, I have made myself into a better person, a better productive person with better moral standards. And, and if given the opportunity to a second chance at life, I would not let you, my family, or society down. I would like to right the wrong that I committed. I would also seek counsel at whatever counseling the board renders that I need to take. And I would like to continue to try to mentor people and be an example to show them how to live a, a productive, to be productive. I would like to thank the Louisiana Parole Project and my attorney, Ms. Jasmine, for representing me. I would like to thank my family and my friends for their continued support and their love and care over the years. And Rob, I would like to thank the board for taking the time to hear my case today. And I would also like to say that life is all about choices and decisions. And I pray that the board will come to the conclusion that I'm not a bad person, just a person that made a bad choice and a bad decision. Thank you. Thank you, sir. All right, so. To know Mr. Arnold is to love him, and anyone who will speak about Mr. Arnold will tell you that he's a gentle giant, and his conviction falls extremely outside of his character. Uh, this is a very unusual case, but I just ask the board to consider his institutional compliance, his age, his length of incarceration, and his current state of health and overall transformation in making this decision. This is the only trouble that Mr. Arnold has ever gotten into, and he was heavily intoxicated and under the influence of an unknown drug at the time. But what is consistent is Mr. Arnold's character, his devotedness, his work ethic, and his willing to help others, willingness to help others. He's a decorated active duty and reserve veteran for the US Army, and he took with him that work ethic and worked over three decades in the tag plant. He self-taught himself to work in five different departments. He's taught over 15 supervisors, I'm sorry, 23 supervisors. And he's proven that he's not only hardworking and reliable, but that he's an essential element of the tag plan. Throughout the years, he has uh, maintained an excellent institutional record, which alone demonstrates his rehabilitation. He's only had seven write-ups in 34 years, and that his last write-up was 10 years ago. He's made class B trustee, which the board is aware is very difficult to do considering the nature of his offenses, but he's proved that he's more than deserving of that status as he spent so many years maintaining his compliance and doing what's asked of him. His trustee status, his permanent job placement, and his low Tiger score all demonstrate the level of trust that the institution puts in him and further proves that he is not going to be a threat to his community. He's taken full responsibility of his actions. And he recognized that drugs and alcohol was the cause of his of his conviction, and he has not looked back since. He's participated in AA, substance abuse, victim awareness, and he's in a great place. That although he's backlogged for risk assessment, he still has uh, he still has plenty of time to complete all phases of risk assessment before his next parole hearing to give the board and himself confidence that he will be successful and he gets the treatment that he needs and wants. He has an excellent. Uh, Reentry plan and his overall institutional success speaks for itself. He spent the last 34 years trying to right his wrongs and prove that he's not a threat to his community. And he now prays that you see him for who he is today and not the worst thing that he's ever done and recognize his consistency in his progress and his devotion to his job and to helping others and to, in his commitment to self betterment and his overall institutional success and recommend a commutation 
of his sentence under any conditions that the board deems necessary. Thank you. Board is prepared to vote. We'll start with Mr. Marabella. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Arnold, uh, I thoroughly enjoyed uh, talking with you. Uh, are very well respected by everyone in the prison institution. Uh, the speakers uh, have spoke very glowingly about you. Uh, you have no prior criminal history before this. That's, that's as I stated earlier, that this crime just baffles you. Uh, you have accepted responsibility. You've indicated that as you sat through that trial and you realized, why we, you know, this must have happened. Uh, you do have law enforcement opposition and you do have victim opposition. Uh, you are a uh, honorably discharged retired veteran. Uh, you have an excellent prison record. Uh, you have excellent recommendations by your supervisors where you've been employed at, the, at prison enterprises, the tag factory for 38 years, I believe 34 years. Uh, you have some medical issues that are going on. You have a tremendous transition plan with the Louisiana Parole Project. I do want to see you get into that sub, that sex offender treatment program. Uh, you will have some time, as Ms. Cole has indicated, uh, to do that. Uh, I'm just one vote. But my recommendation to the governor is going to be to commute your sentence to 99 years with immediate parole eligibility. Good luck to you, sir. Thank you, sir. Mr. Frank. Uh, I agree with Mr. Marabella. Uh, make sure you get into that sex offender treatment because you will have a parole hearing and without it, it would be hard to be granted parole without that treatment. So yes, uh, I also vote to grant and to commute the sentence to 99 years with immediate eligibility. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Mr. Arnold, good afternoon. Good afternoon. I have one question before I vote. Yes, sir. How tall is the general giant? How tall who? Is the general giant? I, I, uh, six, six, seven, six, eight. Okay. Uh, Mr. Honor, job well done. Working one job, uh, 34 years is amazing. My vote is to commute to uh, 99 years with the need for eligibility. If I'm sitting on the floor, Board, and you had your sex offender treatment, you should have no problem. Thank you, sir. All right, Mr. Arnold, I do concur with my colleagues. My vote is the same for the same reasons. I won't repeat them. Uh, so we'll make the recommendation on your behalf to the governor that your sentence be commuted and that you be to 99 years and that you be immediately parole eligible. Good luck to you, sir. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you. Well, the commutation. I'm sorry about that. I just didn't realize I was I was on play. The commutation board didn't go through the details of this case, but Richard provided me with the details and we'll go through it. And then we'll also fast forward to his parole hearing, which takes place about one year after this hearing actually took place just November 30th of 2023. And on the parole hearing, the assistant district attorney shows up and speaks. And it's possible that they didn't show up at this hearing because they weren't notified. We've seen that happen time and time and time again. But the, she, but the ADA spoke on behalf of the victim and said that the victim is still traumatized. Before we get into the facts and the brutality of this case, um, I just want to vent a little bit about one of his supporters who said, sometimes things have to happen. And this happening, this thing, it was a blessing. Are you kidding me? <laughs> I mean, imagine if the victim was there. And I'm not going to give her the benefit of the doubt and say if the victim was there that she wouldn't have said that because we have seen 
dozens and dozens and dozens of times where similar statements are made by supporters. And then immediately after the victim gets up and you see how her life is shattered. And it's just, it's, it just blows my mind every time how insensitive and really wacko some of these supporters are with their statements. And then she goes on to say, my grandson is the man he is because of him. He's a straight A student and a football player because of him. And that's just, it's like, okay. So the defendant was a 30 year old drill sergeant in the army reserve, which I don't really understand how, I think the guy supporting him said that he was, he was in the operations, uh, intelligence operations, and that's quite different than a drill sergeant. Um, so think of a six foot six, 270 pound drill sergeant. The victim was 20 years old, five foot four, and 110 pounds. The defendant accosted the victim during an early evening in a parking lot as she returned to her truck from a grocery store. As she approached her truck from a distance, she saw the defendant depart from his car, an older model, light-colored Mercury. The defendant intercepted and told the victim um, from behind as she prepared to unlock her truck that he had a knife and he would use it if she did not do what he told her. She said, excuse me? He repeated the threat. And if you can imagine a more terrifying he literally is a giant she then entered the truck and attempted to unlock and exit the passenger side um defendant grabbed her by her hair and warned her not to make any further attempts to escape him when the defendant drove away the victim yelled for help but was forced to lean down in the seat while the defendant held her hair and the knife defendant drove to another parking lot and ordered the victim to remove her pants um, and undergarments. The defendant drove away from this lot when another vehicle drove up. He later returned to the lot when he attempted three times to vaginally assault her, compelling her with the knife to assist his third effort, again threatening her with the knife if she bit or hurt him. He forced the victim to perform fellatio and caused him to climax. He, he coerced this performance by keeping the knife against her body and scratching her buttocks with it. The defendant permitted the victim to dress while he cleans himself and wiped the interior of the truck with white towel, apparently to remove fingerprints. He then stuck the towel in her mouth and told her to get out of the truck. As she attempted to do so, he grabbed her hair, pulled her over, and stabbed her in the neck. The victim struggled with him, pulled the knife from her neck, and was cut on her hands and thigh. The defendant then forcibly threw or pushed the victim from the truck. She ran screaming for help. You know, when you read those facts of the case, it brings a little bit of uh, annoyance, even for Mr. O'Shea to call him the gentle giant. Now, it makes all the difference when you have an ADA show up and you have a victim show up and it's possible they don't commute him if they show up. And again, we have seen many times where the parole, where they, where they don't get in touch with the victims, they, this the excuse, that excuse. But again, they do show up at the parole hearing and we'll watch it, not the victim, but the, the assistant to the district attorney on behalf of the victim. Now, the next thing that I simply cannot accept with this hearing is his excuse. He makes up a ridiculous excuse. He says, I was driving and I picked up a hitchhiker. The hitchhiker, you know, I made a mistake. Um, I never did any narcotics or anything, but he had a, a piece, a weapon on his lap. And he said, take me here. And then I said, oh, you don't know me from Adam. And that was my mistake because the hitchhiker got mad. And to protect my life, I had to show him I wasn't a cop. You know, he didn't say those exact words, but that's what he, I believe, was alluding to. So I took a hit. And then the next thing I know, I wake up being watched by, being, you know, spoken to by police. 
Now, being a giant, you can't, you know, you're going to be real easy to identify. So what excuse did he have? I don't remember a thing. And how can the board let him get away with it? That is bogus. I don't believe it for half a second. And I don't know how the board can believe it for half a second. This man can legit, you're choosing to believe his story that he took a hit from a stranger who threatened him and he only did it because he was threatened. And it brought out his inner demons or that he has always had this inside of him and it can come out again or maybe even this wasn't his first time. Remember, this this happened in a time before cell phones, in a time before this was in the 80s. People were able to get away with this stuff easier than they can now. Residents of the apartment buildings served by the parking lot who saw the victim and the defendant fighting gave descriptions of the defendant which corroborated the description not to mention he's driving a car he's operating he's he's perfectly functional in every way it's just it's just bogus the description given by the victim to police they saw the defendant move the white towel on the ground with his feet but something out of the truck which he repeatedly dropped and thereafter calmly walked away does that sound like someone who's blown out of their mind calmly walking away Police arrested the defendant when he walked into the grocery store parking lot where he kidnapped the victim and where his car was parked. The defendant had fresh cuts on his hands and was later identified in a photographic lineup. The defendant told the police and testified that he did not know what he was doing because he had consumed alcoholic beverages and had been forced by an armed hitchhiker to smoke marijuana. The defendant said he had no memory of the crimes. You know, every time I smoke marijuana, I also become a... Uh, a raging uh, nut job, but, but actually I don't, I don't like, um, I don't smoke. Not that I think there's anything wrong with it. I just don't particularly enjoy it. The defendant had attempted to murder the victim that is to cause death or great bodily harm by stabbing her neck, an intentional crime, not congruous, not congruous with the intent to release his victim if she submitted to his force and gave up something of value. Under the circumstances of this record, we agree from the conviction of attempted murder, but not aggravated kidnapping. <laughs> By the way, that was because, so this comes out of, he appealed that he, it, it's so ridiculous. He appealed, for, first they, they, they like gave him a charge of, of, um, of ransom and and he appealed the ransom saying, I didn't ransom. And they were like, well, it was sexual. Um, she had to do that in order to get out. And then they go through the questioning of her, the victim. She's questioned in this appeal um, and said, did he ever say, I'll let you out if you do this? And if you can imagine, she's put on the stand to go through all of this stuff. And it seems that he won that appeal. It seems he even won the appeal on aggravated kidnapping, which is absolutely they don't affirm the kidnapping. How is that not kidnapping? It's insane, really. Some of the, I mean, he got life anyways, but how do you not prove that that's aggravated kidnapping? The defendant was sentenced to 20 years of hard labor, maximum exposure 50 years for attempted aggravated assault, to 15 years of hard labor for maximum 15 years for aggravated crime against nature, and 20 years of hard labor for attempted second degree. All three sentences were made concurrent. You know, if he hadn't put the knife in her neck, he, he would have been out of prison a long time ago. We were made concurrent with the benefit of probation, parole, suspension, and sentence for aggravated. Uh, well, I wouldn't say that he might not have gotten out, but who knows? Um, mandatory life imprisonment without the benefit of probation, parole, suspension, and sentence. The def the trial court, with benefit of the. Pre of the pre-sentence report noted the defendant was a 30-year-old high school graduate who 
was born and reared in Pennsylvania. He was honorably discharged from the service, attaining a rank of E5 and serving in Hawaii, Korea, and New Zealand. After leaving military service, the defendant returned to Pennsylvania, married, and moved to Louisiana where his wife and relatives, no children, were born in the marriage, although his wife had children. A sentencing, his wife had moved out of state. <laughs> Good for his wife. Good for his wife. In Louisiana, defendant worked as a groundskeeper before he discharged for poor work. Huh. He was discharged for poor work. I was such an outstanding guy, I thought. He then worked in a warehouse until the business closed in 1986. Except for being in the Army Reserve at rank of E6, the defendant was unemployed when arrested. Again, you see how they made him out to be such an amazing guy in this hearing? He's honorably discharged. He was somehow, he went from a drill sergeant to operations intelligence. He's an outstanding guy in the reserves. He was an unemployed. Drifter, more or less. I mean, not a drifter, but he was not an outstanding person. Specifically, finding no mitigating factors except the defendant's lack of prior criminal record, the trial court stated it was difficult to imagine a more serious and heinous crime. Who knows what he did? Here's what I'm going to point out. Who knows what trail of victims he has when he was serving in Hawaii, when he was serving in Korea, and maybe even when he was serving in New Zealand. But if you don't think that someone like this might have a trail of victims from those locations, I think I, 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 I believe he is a serial. You just don't do that. And he's free. Well, he's going to have a parole hearing. We'll find out. Oof. Serious, which many will be marked for life. She is fearful of engaging in the most everyday undertaking. It was fortunately, and was fortunate to have survived the stab wound in her neck. Remember, the knife was plunged in her neck. She could easily have been mortally wounded, for which she was hospitalized for several days. Detailing the evidence against the defendant, the court specifically rejected his defense of intoxication and noted that throughout the course of his horrendous conduct, his actions were deliberate, careful, well-planned, and intelligently executed. I don't know about that. I mean, it was done in public with a bunch of witnesses in a parking lot. The <laughs> I actually to completely disagree with those statements. Well, careful, well-planned, intelligently executed? No. The trial court contrasted the size of the victim and the defendant, pointing the defendant's adequate education, training, and family. The trial court found no reason or mitigating the defendant's conduct. The trial court held that lesser sentences would depreciate the extreme seriousness of the offense. The sentences pronounced would have removed the defendant. The defendant's conviction of aggravated kidnapping is set aside, and the defendant is convicted of just simple kidnapping. How? I don't know. That makes no sense, but... Whatever. The law is weird. The case is remanded for resentencing for simple kidnapping. All the convictions otherwise are affirmed. And I think it was that because, again, they, they said that he didn't um, do a ransom. And I think because he didn't, they said it wasn't a ransom. Maybe that's why it goes um, down to the simple kidnapping. But you see, they actually question her. Were you threatened during the attack? Um, he told me if I didn't do what he said, he would use the knife. Okay, but did he say why he was kidnapping you? When we were driving, I asked why he was kidnapped, why he had kidnapped me, and he said that he was taking me to this guy who sold narcotics, that he would give the narcotics to me or to girls instead of to him. Okay, and that is all I knew. All right, what else did he say about why he kidnapped you? Remember, they're trying to find out if he kidnapped her for a certain purpose, that would make it aggravated kidnapping versus simple. But of course he couldn't after for a simple, for a specific purpose. What was all he said that the time when he were driving through the parking lot, he asked, you know, where I went to school and I told him um, where I was from and he told me Philadelphia. And she's a college student, right? Okay, how did this conversation come about? Well, I'm asking him, you know, why did he have to, you know, why he wouldn't let me go and just, he said that he was just in town for a few days and he wanted to have some fun. Um, basically, anyways, but again, I'm going to reiterate how I do think that he just got away with it. Think about the countries he's been stationed in. 
what he might have done when he was there and how he just used the excuse that he doesn't remember a thing. It's uh, this is scary. And the ADA shares her perspective in in the next hearing. And we'll jump into that. Arnold, um, as I look at the record, uh, the reason the board voted to commute your sentence in May of 2022 was conduct or other improvement. You had a favorable recommendation by the facility warden. Uh, you're a decorated veteran with no prior criminal history. You had an excellent institutional and disciplinary record, excellent work evaluations, and great comments by your supervisors. So since you're hearing, and, and again, as Mr. Kelsey said, in effect, you, the governor resentenced you August 1st, 2023, when he commuted your sentence to life from life to 99 years with immediate parole eligibility. So that's why we're here today. So since your hearing in May of 2022, has anything changed in your situation? No, ma'am. Uh, other than uh, I'm, I'm enrolled in my some of the programs that the, the risk management, anger management. I just graduated anger management, but I'm still backlogged for substance abuse. Okay. And you still, where do you work? You still at your uh, same job? Yes, ma'am. That's at the tag plant? Yes, ma'am. How long you had that job? 35 years, ma'am. Well, I'm sure they'd like to keep you there. <laughs> they must like you there. I trained, I 20, I so trained, 20, I trained 23 uh, supervisors for the job while I was over there. Well, there you go. Warren Falco, is there anything you can uh, tell us about Mr. Arnold? N nothing has changed since uh, since his pardon uh, hearing. Uh, like I said, he continues to work in the tag plant, and yeah, we will we will miss his uh, if he's uh, granted his expertise and his experience in that tag plant. Okay, thank you, Mr. Arnold. Should you be successful today, what's your transition plan? I plan plan to go to the parole project and take the programs there, and and enroll in a sobriety course. I, I like and um, continue, you know, positive. Uh, my my, you know, pop pop pop. Um, excuse me, uh, Madam Chairman. I, I like to continue on with my positive aspect of life. So you know, is that a long-term arrangement with the parole project, or are you eventually going to go with them? Ma'am, I, I didn't understand. Is, that a, is, the, is your um, arrangement with the parole project long-term, or do you eventually expect to end up with them? When, when you when you get out, you go into the parole project. Where? After the parole project, are you planning on going with family somewhere, or are you staying to with a, the parole project? To, to a halfway house in, in Pennsylvania. Okay. Pennsylvania. Okay, that's what I was getting at. I, I was wondering if you were going back to home in Pennsylvania. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yeah, excuse me, Madam Chairman. I'm having trouble hearing. My my hearing kind of bad. Okay. Well, I don't have any other questions. Thank you, Mr. Arnold. Welcome. I want to apologize. Ms. Holly Jones is here and she'll speak at the appropriate time as well. All right, we'll hear from Mr. Kerry Meyer. Uh, good morning, Kerry Myers with Louisiana Parole Project. Uh, we're here to tell the board that we uh, are in full support of, of Mr. Arnold. Uh, based on his status, uh, we are working to, 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 to find him approved long-term housing. Um, he, I know he wants to go home. Um, uh, should that not become available, we are committed to to to, uh, to finding him housing or to housing him here with us. But our first goal is to find him long-term permanent housing near his home. Uh, but we are committed, should that not be available, uh, to 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 house Mr. Arnold in in, in the long run. Um, his record, his his record as a veteran, his record as as his stability at the prison, the the idea that that. At 35 years on the same job, uh, Mr. Arnold, his is, is age and his health is no threat to anyone. Uh, we would just ask this board to grant him conditionally today based on uh, an approved, uh, approved housing plan. All right, thank you. Here from Mr. Uh, Ronald Arnold now. 
Yes, sir. I uh, have corresponded with uh, Mr. Carey and uh, Ms. Cole uh, concerning Dwayne's housing situation. Um, I agree that as soon as we can locate permanent housing for my brother, uh, we had we had one in place, but here here we are, three weeks out. Uh, that fell through, and so we're we're making attempts, grave attempts, to make sure that uh, we can get him housed and and, and properly taken care of uh, for his condition. All right, thank you, thank you. Ms. Cole. Would you like to make a statement, or would you like to uh, wrap up at the end? Uh, may I make a, a statement at the end, please? Okay. A uh, brief statement from Mr. Norris Henderson. He was having uh, okay. issues with his Great. Also, so. All right. Now we'll hear from Mr. Miss Holly Jones. You're on mute. Okay. Can you hear me now? You can. Uh, good morning. Um, my name is Holly Chambers Jones. I'm the first assistant district attorney from Washington Parish. I did turn in a um, objection letter. Um, it's my appreciation that the victim was hesitant to participate in this, and so I'm participating um, to let our wishes be known that we do not, uh, we would not like to see Mr. Arnold out on parole. Um, Mr. Arnold's still of an age that. Um, He's only 10 years older than I am, um, and he's still of an age that he could recidivate. This crime was extremely heinous. He was approximately, I think, 29 years old when he committed the crime. Um, my personal belief and experience of uh, uh, 25 years as a district attorney is persons who commit these types of crimes continue to commit these crimes. These are not rehabilitative crimes. This is something that's in that person. And I think it's unjust for a person who, this was not an acquaintance. This was not someone familiar. This is every woman's worst nightmare to be abducted off the street and raped and kidnapped and to put him on back on the street uh, at the chance that he may recidivate is too great a risk. And I wanted our opinion to be known about that. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. All right, Dwayne, would you like to make a statement on your behalf? Uh, yes, sir. I'm 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 not the same person I was 20 uh 35 years ago. I'm a different person now. I <coughs> thoughts, feelings, and beliefs are totally different. My attitude is different. I'm spiritually, mentally, and emotionally a different person. I'm always striving to go forward and and uh, do positive things and help others do positive things. And I'm I'm truly sorry for what what my actions did to Miss Joan and to her family and to her community and to my family. And I am sorry. All right, thank you, Miss Cole. Would you like to wrap it up? Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, I just want to highlight a few things. Mr. Arnold has dedicated 35 long years with the TAG plant, and he has received countless awards and certificates that demonstrate his hard work ethic. Um, even through his diminishing health, even in excruciating pain, he showed up for work. Um, not only did he show up for work, but he was willing to help others, including being able to train 23 supervisors and also instilling the principles of hard work to his mentors and his coworkers. Um, as you can see, Mr. Arnold is not in the best of health. He is in a wheelchair. Um, he also had a kidney removed due to cancer. He's had untreated diabetes. He's awaiting uh, insulin treatment, and he still has to undergo another cataract surgery due to complications with his uh, diabetes. So with that being said, his current state of health and his low TIGER score demonstrate that he is actually low risk of rec recidivism. Um, to support that, Mr. Arnold has consistently demonstrated through his institutional compliance that he is a rehabilitated man. Uh, he's completed programming and he's currently in programming. 
Um, he has not been an issue for DOC. Um, in the 36 years that he's been incarcerated, he's only received seven write-ups and he hasn't received a single write-up in more than a decade. Um, for that same amount of time, he has been a, a class B trustee, which is the highest level of trustee status that he is able to obtain. Um, he's held that status uninterruptedly for more than 12, uh, 12 years. And he has a host of support from Louisiana Parole Project and from his family who are willing to provide wraparound services and ensure that he has the support that he needs so that he has a successful transition. And he also receives the medical attention that he so desperately needs. Um, we're awaiting an approved ICOT in Pennsylvania. So he'll be states away from where the crime took place, where his victim is. And so for these reasons, we request that you consider his health and his age, consider his uh, status, his programming, and his reentry plan and grant his release on parole. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming. All right, it's pal prepared to vote. Mm -hmm. yes. Mr. Arnold. Yeah. Uh, I voted for you on the pardon, so I stand by that vote. My vote today is to grant your parole. You have an excellent prison record. Frankly, because of your age and length of incarceration, uh, sweating my vote also. You have no prior criminal history. You have a low risk score. Um, but I want you to go do the parole project plan. Let them help you while you're there. And they have some substance abuse education. I believe you can enroll in until they get your details of your ICOPs worked out. Uh, special condition after release, uh, when you get situated in your permanent housing, Enroll in a sobriety plan, and you have to abide, of course, by the sex offender contract. Good luck to you, sir. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Mr. Freeman? Uh, I concur with Ms. Renatza. Uh, go to the uh, parole project, get them to start working on that interstate compact. I think that's your best avenue is to get down there to Pennsylvania around family. And uh, good luck to you. Thank you, sir. I choose us to grant your parole. I'm also going to vote to grant your parole for the work you've done, the time you've put in, good programs, low score. Uh, you'll report to the Louisiana Parole Project, then you'll work on your ICOTs to Pennsylvania, get that done. Uh, you have a sobriety, work against a sobriety plan and work on that. And you'll uh, have a curfew from 9P to 6A. You understand stipulations? Yes, sir. Right, three votes to grant today. Your parole's been granted. Good luck. Well, and there you have it. He got paroled. The ADA showed up. I don't know if we've ever seen her before, Holly Jones. Uh, but she wanted to put it on the record, whether it was about protecting themselves in case something happened or whether because she's, you know, remember, she's been in ADA a long time. I assume she's seen a lot of these cases, like she said. And, uh, if, you know, just the assumptions that the guess is, I don't know, you know, no one's, I, I can't, you can't put charges on someone that doesn't exist, but just taking it back to where we were, he had served overseas in three different countries and it almost, well, it does make me wonder because it's just hard to believe that someone out of the blue goes and does something like this. It really is just hard to believe. And then you add on top of it that he doesn't take really any accountability. He states that he was blitzed out of his mind. And really what is, what is one of the worst, most bizarre, ridiculous excuses, I don't remember a thing and he also says, I think about it every day, what I've caused. And if, imagine if you woke up and cops were arresting you for something like this, but you legitimately had no memory of it. Would you really wake up and think about every day what you have caused? If you don't know, if you don't remember what you've caused, I mean, think about what he said in his initial hearing. I don't remember any of it. It must have happened, though. It's just Frankly, I call bull. And uh, someone who takes that approach at a hearing should not be released. If you, 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 I, I think what's required is taking accountability, even if he has to make it up. Mm. 
But at his at his size, he certainly can be a major danger still. Uh, he is he is he is far from being out of out of a danger to, to society and we'll keep track. Uh, you know, he, he has to figure out his housing and that might be a problem, might be a while, but they're sending him to a different state and Louisiana likes to do that. And it's very rare to get a commutation, to get a parole denied after commutation, although we have seen it. Maybe if the victim would have shown up, it could have maybe, but that's not, I'm not putting anything on on the victim, the survivor. There, don't I'm not. Please don't take it that way. And, and it probably wouldn't have made a difference. Uh, not with this. Not with this panel, at least. Uh, so, no reason to put her through that trauma. There you have it. With that, I'll let you go.